Go Sweet Honey and the Rock, and many more. Saturday night at 9.30 on NJTV. This is NJTV. New Jersey will lead America to a new era of honesty, responsibility, and prosperity, and we'll do it together. Yes, we've got a problem, don't we? But not to worry, we're New Jersey. We are problem solvers, and come November 5th, problem solved. And so the race is on. We will take a look at what the candidates had to say, what the voters had to say, and why the governor is now ordering a special election. It's all ahead, here on NJ Today. Major funding for NJ Today provided in part by New Jersey manufacturers, auto insurance and more for New Jersey Business and Industry Association members and their employees. New Jersey Association of Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njar.com. Verizon, communication solutions designed for the people and businesses of New Jersey. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. Wells Fargo, together we'll go far. The Star Ledger and NJ.com. And by PSENG, serving customers, strengthening the business community, and investing in New Jersey's future. Now stay tuned for NJ Today. From the production studios of Montclair State University, this is NJ Today with Mike Schneider. Hello, we are being told tonight that the voter turnout today was pretty low, but important decisions were being made. Democratic and Republican voters were choosing their candidates for governor and for the legislature too. All 40 of the seats in the state Senate, all 80 seats in the assembly. The polls closed at 8 p.m. and so far it does not look like there were any real surprises. We have the boards to put up for you right now, and we will do so. There you see Governor Christie cruising to victory in the Republican gubernatorial primary, 92% of the vote. Basically, by the time the polls were closed, the Associated Press was predicting that the governor, having spent about $6 million in the primary in terms of advertising, television ads, and things like that, would in fact get the nomination of his party for another term in office. Over on the Democratic side, of course, Barbara Bono was the only announced candidate of any consequence in terms of fundraising and in terms of organization, and she too cruised to victory today. Uh, this will make her not the presumptive Democratic candidate for governor, but the official candidate for governor of the state Democratic Party. Uh, when it came to legislature races, there were some very interesting and hotly contested ones at that. Go over to Nia Gill right now, the state senator who is running for re-election in the 34th Senate district. You saw Gill was up against a very strong challenge from Mark Alexander. At least it seemed that way going into Election Day, into the primary voting. Mark Alexander used to be the state head for the president's, uh, President Obama's re-election campaign here in New Jersey. Uh, challenged Gill aggressively, but Senator Gr Gill has been re-elected by almost a two-to-one margin, at least according to the numbers that we have put together. Move on over right now to another one of these contested races. Joe Carrillos, the state senator who had run against Bob Menendez for the U.S. Senate seat last year and is now rumored to be a possibility in terms of running for the uh, seat that had been held by the late Senator Lautenberg. He also cruised to victory as well, despite a challenge being mounted by the Tea Party challenger, Leanne Ballou. And another race we want to share for you as well, uh, Ray Lesniak, the state senator, he too was being challenged by Donna Obe. Uh, there was talk that some of the competing political machines in his district were out to try to uh, to unseat the senator as they had tried to do last time around. But you can see once again, Senator Lesniak has won re-election, or I should say won the nomination once again, which according to some observers is tantamount to re-election in that district uh, by a rather convincing margin of approximately two to one. Uh, this evening at about 10 o'clock, about an hour ago, Governor Christie and his family came out uh, in Bridgewater where they had been waiting for the results to come in and celebrated his nomination for another four years in office. Let's take a look and see what the governor had to say this evening. We're presented with an opportunity, an opportunity once again to make an example for America right here in New Jersey, to show that real, strong, principled, 
honest leadership can bring people together and lead a state out of debt and deficit and to prosperity again. What we want to do is to create a whole new coalition, not just of Republicans, but of independents and of right-thinking Democrats, not just of people in the suburbs, but of people in the cities, not just of people of wealth, but of people who aspire to wealth. We can do it together, and we will do it together. This November, we'll do it together. Governor Christie, about one hour ago, our chief political correspondent, Michael Aaron, was in the room covering the governor. Michael, the governor had a very strong message, of course, uh, for his supporters in that room, for the Republicans in the state of New Jersey, and for the other voters in New Jersey that he hopes will vote for him. But he also sent a message, Michael, uh, on a national level as well. Uh, he was projecting far beyond that room, it appeared. He was, Mike. Uh, he talked about how since he's come into office, Republicans have retaken the House of Representatives. They now have 30 governorships. Uh, his campaign says they had a very good night tonight. In fact, they feel this is a record-breaking night. According to them, no sitting governor who has faced a primary challenge in his second term has ever done better than 65 percent. Tom Kane and Christy Whitman didn't have primary challengers. But among those who did, none has ever done better than 65 percent, and they're saying that with 85 percent of the vote counted, Governor Christie has about 92 percent of the vote. So they're calling this a very satisfying night for them. You know, uh, obviously, Michael, this was a very interesting day because the governor, uh, I guess, almost upstaged himself uh, this morning in terms of, uh, I guess, the politics uh, outshadowing the primary in some ways when he went out and announced that, in fact, he was ordering a special election to fill the unexpired term of Senator Frank Lautenberg as well. And once again, that put him in a situation where some national uh, party members are not particularly happy that he didn't immediately appoint one of his own, one, a fellow Republican, to occupy that seat. Uh, but, but I take it that this was not a decision that was entered into quickly or lightly and that it plays into the governor's overall strategy. What do you hear about that? Well, I think he did do it fairly quickly. Uh, one day after Senator Lautenberg dies, and we already have a process. But you're right that uh, he is sensing some criticism from hardcore Republicans around the country. I understand former House Majority Leader Dick Armey may have uh, blasted Christie on national television this afternoon. His people seem sensitive to this point. One of them came up to me and said, what did you think of today's decision? Uh, I think there's a little bit of concern, but I, I think they're comfortable that he has taken a kind of middle ground between holding off until November 2014 and uh, doing the thing that would have hurt him and run a simultaneous Senate and gubernatorial election in November. So it's very much in the air in this room. The political chatter is all about who, who's going to get the the nod from Christie, and we're expecting that before the end of this weekend. All right, our chief political correspondent, Michael Aaron. Michael, thank you very uh, much. In fact, I did uh, get a chance to see the comment was made by the former Republican leader, uh, Dick Armey. He called the governor politically stupid. That's a quote, politically stupid for making a decision not to appoint a Republican to fill the unexpired Lautenberg term. All right, let's go over to the Democratic side right now, where State Senator Barbara Bono uh, has now made it official. She is the nominee of the Democratic Party to challenge Governor Christie, and she was making her challenge very, very clear a couple of hours ago. The problem is, my friends, we are saddled. We are saddled with the governor who defunded Planned Parenthood and our health clinics and is telling New Jersey women by that defunding that we just better figure it out on our own. That we... Our problem is a governor who, after two storms in as many years, is still hedging about the reality that is climate change. Yes, we've got a problem, don't we? But not to worry. We're New Jersey. We are problem solvers. And come November 5th, problem solved. Our David Cruz was in the room there in Edison with the Bono uh, campaign was celebrating its victory and its move on to challenge the governor in November. Uh, David, give me a sense of, of the, what, you're, what you're picking up in the way of the political vibe and the energy level and their degree of confidence, if you will. 
Well, Mike, you know, Governor Chris Christie, Chris Christie has thrown has thrown more curveballs at the uh, estab political establishment here than a major league baseball pitcher. I'm having some difficulty hearing you, but I'll tell you that we are literally the last men standing in here. But uh, with all of the machinations that went on today, ultimately Barbara Buono came out here and found a lot of support, especially from some of the big Democrats around the state, including uh, Senate President Steve Sweeney and others. Uh, David, I'll give you a second there for uh, viewers at home. Sometimes you get a little bit of an echo going on as well. Uh, shall we continue with David right now or we want to move on? All right. David Cruz reporting for us uh, from the Edison campaign headquarters this evening for Senator Bono. Uh, Senator Nina Gill up against the challenger of uh, some consequence in the view of many, uh, Mark Alexander, the Seton Hall law professor. Uh, but uh, Senator Gill prevailed by a rather handy margin. Let's hear what she had to say about her victory. The struggle does not end tonight. We cannot back down. We must strive ahead and keep fighting for progress, for a higher minimum wage, for early voting, for tougher gun control laws, and to ensure that all of our children receive a good public education. Tonight's victory is not about it's about the people of the 34th District who have once again allowed me the privilege to represent them in Trenton. Thank you again for your support. And now it's on to victory in November because we don't back down. Senator Nina Gill celebrating her victory. Our Desiree Taylor was in that room this evening. Uh, watched the race unfold. Uh, Desiree, uh, I guess there were many who thought that Senator Gill would prevail. But I don't know how many there were who thought that she would win by this larger margin. What are they saying over there this evening? for a second, perhaps the, you can see the, the enthusiasm being generated around Desiree might make it impossible for her to hear me. Uh, shall we try Desiree again or should we move, move on? All right, Desiree, can you hear me? It's Mike. Uh, and if you can, go ahead and start. Okay. Let me know what's going on. Well, as you can tell, the party is still in full swing here at Senator Nia Gill's headquarters. We still have some of the, the old faithfuls here, including Senator Gill. So excited about her victory tonight over her challenger, Mark Alexander. Now, the party started here actually around 9.15. That's when Senator Gill walked in here. She started dancing and singing uh, the lyrics, We Won't Back Down. She repeated that over and over tonight. It appears that's the rallying cry uh, for tonight as well as during her campaign. Now, during her speech, she thanked her supporters, and she also said that this election, that she believes she won, she won this election based on the issues that she's been fighting for uh, since she's been in the state legislature over the past two decades, among them issues like women's health care, and she co-sponsored a bill that created a needle exchange program uh, in the state to help uh, reduce the spread of HIV and AIDS. And uh, Senator Gill believes it's this track record Again, that helped her um, pull off this victory tonight. Now, I also spoke with Senator Gill one-on-one, -on -one, and during that interview, she told me she takes no challenger for granted, uh, including her opponent for this race, Mark Alexander. He's a Seton Hall law professor who was expected to, to give her quite a challenge tonight, but in the end, that proved unsuccessful. Now, uh, since this is a heavily uh, Democratic district, uh, tonight's uh, victory for Senator Gill essentially ensures she'll be back in the state Senate for another term. That's the story here at Senator Gill's headquarters in Montclair. Yeah! Now back to you. All right, you, well, you can see, thank you, Desiree. You can see, obviously, that uh, Nia Gill's supporters are enthusiastic and follow directions, apparently, 
as well from correspondents who need a little quiet from time to time. Uh, joining us right now is Krista Jenkins. She's the executive director of the Fairleigh Dickinson University Public Mind Poll. We welcome you back to the program. Thank you. Uh, no major surprises in terms of the results in terms of the victors, uh, Nia Gill's race, for instance, though, the margin was rather uh, That's right. You wouldn't expect some. there to be any kind of upsets tonight. It's a low turnout election, and it's very difficult to defeat a sitting incumbent, uh, even at, you know, at the primary stage. So not, not a big surprise in any of those races. When you, when you looked at the polling numbers coming in, the, the polling that you've done at Fairleigh Dickinson, uh, w w tell me about the mood, of the, uh, the mood of the voters coming in. Well, the mood of the voters, believe it or not, is, is quite good. I mean, the last time that we asked our question about, you know, is the state headed in the right direction or is it on the wrong track, we found that 57% believe that the state is headed in the right direction. So in that kind of environment, it is difficult for anyone to take on a sitting incumbent. Does that say anything about where you go from the primary to the general? Uh, we've got until now, until November, if you don't count the special elections, of course, in between. But, uh, but the climate that exists right now, uh, are these numbers solid numbers or is there any sort of uh, volatility out there? Well, they've been quite solid for some time. And so in the absence of any, you know, shock to the system, you might, you might say, I, I don't anticipate them being, you know, uh, that, that likely to change. Although, you know, it is uh, quite a long time between now and November. So, so things can, can change, of course. The political uh, sentiment in the state right now, is it tied in much to the personalities to the to the uh, the everyday life experiences of people, to what they hear and read about, uh, I guess uh, where the uh, economy is going. What exactly? Well, when you ask that question, the, the thing that comes to mind is we've asked a series of questions about Governor Christie, and um, one of the things that we ask is, pe do people like him and his politics, or do they just like him and not his politics, and the variety of options. And what we found is that since we've asked this question in July, the last time we asked it was a few months ago, there was a sizable uptick in the number of people who like everything about him. So that seems to suggest that it, you know, the, the kind of appeal that he has is, is very, very much tied to not only what he stands for, but also his, his persona. How much of that is shaped by, by media these days? I mean, we hear so much about things going from television to the internet and changing the paradigm in, in some respects and the way the, the candidates try to get their message out. Right, I mean, it's particularly in regard to him, he's such a great user of social media and Twitter and, and, um, so I th and YouTube. And so he's, I think he's quite adroit at, 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 at um, managing his image that way. And I think that certainly um, helps to convey to people that, you know, he's one of them, so to speak. And uh, that's certainly been to his benefit. And you've seen others try to do the same thing. I was going to say on to November now, but we've got the August primary and that's the right. October special elections. We'll be talking to you uh, between now and then, I'm sure. Thank you. Krista Jenkins, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Going to be a whole lot of voting going on this year in New Jersey, as I just was alluding to. That's because this morning, after he voted, the governor announced that he is ordering a special election to fill the seat of the late Senator Frank Lautenberg. And our chief political correspondent, Michael Aaron, has that story. While we're saddened by his passing, and we'll look to the rest of the week to remember his life and his service, I know that Senator Lautenberg wouldn't want the people of New Jersey to go without a voice in the United States Senate. With that, Governor Christie announced he will appoint someone to fill Lautenberg's seat by next week, then hold a special primary election in mid-August and special general election in mid-October. He said election law would allow him to have put it off for a year, but a Senate seat is too important to be held by an unelected appointee for 18 months. The people must decide their nominees quickly, he said, and their senator. This is simply non-negotiable to me. I will not permit the insiders and a few party elites to determine who the nominee of the Republican Party and the Democratic Party will be. A primary election is necessary. The people must choose. Christie could also have set the election on the same day as this November's gubernatorial election, but with Cory Booker likely to run for Senate for the Democrats, that might not have been in Christie's interest. He dismissed the suggestion that self-interest played any role in setting up his timetable. I mean, unless I delayed my decision, Michael, for another 10 days. And, and I just, that's irresponsible. And I wouldn't think it's right for the people of New Jersey. They're going to start debating immigration reform next week. Um, it's not right for me to sit and wait uh, for people to do it. I would have had to delay a, a quite a period of time and also take the dates out to their end dates rather than their inside dates. As for who he'll pick to go to Washington, he hinted it'll be a Republican. 
I'm going to pick the person I believe to be the best person. Then that person is going to determine whether they want to run for the seat or not. And so I'm not looking for any particular person. You know, I've seen all these stories. Well, there's two buckets of people, right? The placeholder people and the people who are candidates. There's one bucket of people, as far as I'm concerned. The governor, his wife Mary Pat, and older son Andrew voted this morning at EMS headquarters in their town of Mendham. Today's primary election has been all but buried by the Lautenberg story and the chain of political decisions it has set up, as the governor alluded to at his press conference later. The primary election will be on August 13th. The general election will be on October 16th. So for all of you who were bored with the governor's race, I have now solved your problem. Christie's action was quick, decisive, but will draw Democratic criticism. For NJ Today, I'm Michael Aaron at the State House. And joining us now is former Governor Jim Florio. Welcome back to the program. Thank you, Mike. You, you watched the uh, Governor Christie's conference this morning. I did. What did you think? Well, I thought it was commendable that he's going to have the elections this year. I mean, he has a discretion. He could have waited till next year. But I think he pointed out correctly that it would be inappropriate to have a, an appointed person for a year and a half or so. So I think that's a good idea. He'll probably take a little bit of flack for having an October election rather than two in November. But... Yeah, it's within his discretion to do it. Would you, if this happened on your watch, would you have done the same thing? Probably would have tried to save the money by having the this, this second election. Um, and I probably would have avoided the primary. Because you're going to have a lot of primary contenders, at least on the Democratic side. I suspect whoever the governor nominates for the Republican side will have no primary problem. Everyone will just sort of fall in line. It, it also means, then, that the process has to be repeated, what, a year and a half down the road as well. Yeah. So you do have an elected senator as opposed to an appointed one who would have more traction seeking right. a full term. But, yeah. but it actually, I guess the political consultants have to love it because there's going to be money spent. Well, New Jersey has more elections than we really need, but um, yeah, it just fits that pattern. Uh, and of course, this all centers around filling the seat of Senator Lautenberg, a man who you knew rather well. Yes. Uh, talk to me about when you heard he had passed away, what, what went through your mind? Well, the senator really is one of those individuals that have a, has a legacy that you can really identify with him. I mean, there are literally millions of people whose lives have been saved or extended because of his efforts, particularly in tobacco, but also alcohol. So there is a direct connection between his courage in taking on those issues before it was popular um, and outcomes that have been beneficial to people. The way he got in to the, you know, back in the 80s, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. uh, you were very politically active at the same time, of course. What did you think of him as, as, a, as a novice politician? Well, he was very uh, aggressive. I mean, he's been aggressive in a very good sense of the word, carrying things through, and was, uh, knew his own mind. He took on a risk. Milton Fenwick at that point was very popular. Um, and he's been doing the same thing ever since, policy-wise and politically. He, is, he also is kind of emblematic for a different kind of political candidate, the one who has the means, if not necessarily always the desire, yeah. but to self-fund. And we've seen a lot more of that in recent years. Yeah. And certainly, Senator Lautenberg, one of the things that he, he said to some of his closest friends was yeah. he didn't like the whole process of having to m raise the money, make yeah. the calls, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But, but he was a, a wealthy candidate uh, in, in the Democratic Party, which kind of, I guess, didn't bother some people necessarily who are questioning you know, the fact that the Senate seems to be a, like a rich man's club traditionally, it has been. The one thing about Senator Lumberg, he didn't give off airs. I mean, he was what he was. He came from a blue-collar background. And notwithstanding the money, he really retained those, uh, those characteristics that we expect um, or really come to expect from people with that kind of background. What does he, politically, what does his loss mean to this state? Well, obviously, losses to the nation in some respects. I mean, he's a very progressive person. Um, was someone who you knew where he was coming down. Uh, to the degree it's up in the air now, we don't know who's going to take the place. Um, it could change dramatically the fortunes of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. As a guy, did you like him? Was he, was he somebody you would consider a buddy? He was somebody that I worked with. I, I don't know buddy would be the proper term, but was somebody you want to have on your side. I mean, he and I were very col close collaborators on environmental issues, which he was involved in and I was involved in, and transportation. I mean, he took a lot of credit legitimately for saving Amtrak. In the 80s, during the Reagan administration, there was a wholesale effort to try to sell it off and to get rid of it. He went into the trenches. We worked collaboratively uh, in doing that. So there were a lot of things that he can claim as his legacy which are legitimate. What about replacing him as the kind of a person 
in that position. You raised a very interesting point. He may have been a very wealthy man, capable of self-funding yeah. if he chose to, but he also retained that poor kid from Patterson yeah. thing, the authenticity that it even his critics very, admit. It may very well be that we're beyond having candidates with his earthy characteristics. I mean, nowadays you have to be cute, modern, you have to be uh, somebody who's very media savvy. And uh, uh, Frank was not media savvy, but he would got it done as a result of merit, as a result of results. That may be something that's dying out. Governor Florio, have to leave it there. Thank you for coming in again, My sir. My pleasure. As you saw, the funeral for Senator Frank Lautenberg is set for tomorrow at the Park Avenue Synagogue in New York City. Eulogies will be delivered by former Secretary of State and New York Senator Hillary Clinton, Vice President Joe Biden, and Senator Bob Menendez. After that, the senator's body will be brought back to New Jersey for a final train ride to Washington, D.C., and burial at Arlington National Cemetery. Senator Lautenberg was a veteran of World War II. He was the last World War II veteran to serve in Congress. That does it for us. I'm Mike Schneider. Thank you very much for watching and have a good night. I didn't really like math until I met Mrs. Cryer. My goal is to make my students love math and I take it seriously. It's tougher now to help every student. Budget cuts have made class sizes larger, but math is so important. So I do what it takes to give my students the help they need. New Jersey's math scores are third in the nation. Mrs. Cry made me actually love math. Our students really excel. And that makes me proud to be a teacher in New Jersey's public schools. I'm Next time on American Masters, Carol Burnett. How can she get a laugh out of everything she does? I am an actress. She was extraordinary. Always being somebody else gave me confidence. <laughs> it was all about play acting and giggling and having a good time. Relive a lifetime of laughter and more. Wow. Carol Burnett, a woman of character on American Masters. Thursday night at 9 on NJTV. Their garden gurus meets super sleuths who combine murder and mayhem at every turn. Tune in each week for Rosemary and Time. Friday night at